Welcome to Brain Ponderings. I'm Mark Matson. Today, the topic is the gut microbiome and emerging evidence that it affects the brain in very interesting ways. And my guest today is Professor John Cryon. He's professor and chair of the Department of Anatomy and Neuroscience at University College Cork in Ireland. He's uh, also an investigator at the APC Microbiome Institute. So they got multiple investigators there in court focusing on the microbiome, various aspects. So welcome, John. Thanks, Mark. Delighted to be here. And you, now I look back at your your history and you didn't start out working on the microbiome. Of course, a lot of people, uh, well, my age for sure, <laughs> didn't know much at all about the microbiome, but there's been an explosion of research on it in the last yeah. Well, 15, 20 years, but even it's accelerating. Um, you you started out looking, you were interested in depression and anxiety <laughs> disorders and how, and kind of the biochemistry of that, how different neurotransmitters are involved. Is that right? That's correct. I mean, uh, but I still am. So I still very much am. So, okay. so, 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 so I, I, you know, I'm a stress neurobiologist who just got lost in the gutter a little bit. But uh, uh, I, 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 I trained initially as a biochemist, uh, morphed into a pharmacologist, neuropharmacologist, focusing on on um, uh, uh, using different, um, uh, looking for novel medications for for anxiety and depression in particular, and use of various animal models. Uh, um, uh, of um, anxiety and depression, and uh, and it wasn't until I moved back to Ireland in two thousand and five that I started working on the gut. Uh, I see, and okay, so you and you did uh, after you got your PhD in uh, what in Galway. Galway, yeah, yeah. I, I I spent some time in and in, in during that time I spent some time in Australia at the University of Melbourne in the psychiatry department there. And uh, I, I, for postdocing, I went to Penn in Philadelphia for a few years, which is really good, really fun yeah. times. Uh, and then I did cross to the other uh, coast to uh, Scripps uh, in La Jolla uh, for um, uh, where I did more work on the relationship between substance abuse and, um, and mood uh, and comorbidities thereof. Mm -hmm. And uh, more work on on intracranial self stimulation models and various things like that. Then I sold my soul. Then I went to industry, uh, and I spent four years as a group leader uh, at Novartis in Switzerland in Basel. And uh, the, they were some of the most exciting times of my career, I have to say. Um, but then the homing gene eventually gets to most Irish people in some way and uh, so um, I there was a new pharmacy school opening here in Cork at the time and um, I decided why not uh, and um, it was a yeah it was a big move to do that and, and then when I got here um, it was quite clear that the Irish funding scene was really picking off uh, and through really core funding from from um, Science Foundation Ireland, they were looking at areas of excellence in across the country. It's a small country, uh, so we can't every place can't be good at everything. And uh, so they had awarded a large, uh, 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 much bigger than a program project grant, but but that type of model uh, to um, uh, to UCC in the area of uh, microbiome research. And that was led out by a gastroenterologist and he was bringing all disciplines with him. And they had a physiology aspect to it, but really no one doing uh, animal work uh, the way I had trained. Uh, my colleague, Ted Dynan was a psychiatrist. Or is it, well, he's retired now, but he was a psychiatrist. He was part of this center. He said to me on my first time week here, you should come and talk to them about what you do. And uh, so it became quite clear that many of the models that I was working on in the depression field, especially models of early life adversity, um, uh, th that, you know, stress is also a harbinger of other disorders. And uh, there was a, a keen interest in irritable bowel syndrome, which is an unloved disorder of the gut brain axis. And so it turned out many of the same models that we were working on in depression were also used in the IBS field as models of IBS, just that people were looking at different uh, outcomes. So that 
as a new faculty here that allowed you to actually have half of your lab working on the brain and the other half working on on on, on gut and visceral pain and various processes so that's how we started and um, the journey into the microbiome from there came with the discovery and I, I i i don't use that word too much but it was a discovery um by a then graduate student she's now on faculty here siobhan Mani, who worked with ted and me uh where she showed that the composition of the microbiome in animals that had been subjected to stress in early life uh was different in adulthood and it was using crude techniques and it was you know but it was kind of it just got got our interest going okay that's that's kind of cool. And um, then we showed, and but we also realized that it had already been shown uh, in a in a J Physiol paper from about five years earlier that mice that grow up without microbes in their gut uh, are having exaggerated HPA axis response to acute stress. So they have a, a hormonal response to acute stress. So that was originally shown by Sudo's group in Japan, but it never really got any attention. We, we started working with our germ-free facility to show the same. And so now all of a sudden stress is affecting the microbiome and the microbiome is regulating how we're dealing with stress. And that led to some seminal work that we did showing that a specific strain of bacteria could uh, attenuate the effects of stress. And we published that in PNAS in 2011. And um, that kind of was a, a big turning point because now we have uh, we have the whole picture starting to come together about that the, the microbiome is relevant for uh, how um, the body deals with, with stress in an acute or chronic state. And so that was a really important part. And since okay. then, it's, it's been expanding on that. So start with, let's start with a little bit of the basics. So yeah. what is a microbiome and, yeah. and what's known about like how many species of bacteria? So, so, so the microbiome is the collection of all microorganisms that we have in and on our bodies. Uh, um, we, are very bacteria focused, uh, but they're only one part of the puzzle. We also have um, um, uh, viruses, often bacteriophages, which are viruses that target bacteria. So, so it's very much you know a a, 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 a very close interaction. But also for the fungi, uh, archaea, single cell organisms. So it's quite a complex ecosystem, and it's really an ecosystem. And uh, in terms of the the amount of them it's 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 astounding at times mark when you start thinking about it like if we looked at the genes that we have uh we would be more than 99 percent microbial huh. i mean you know just think of we've always spent on the human genome project and it's for less than one percent of our own genes you know if yeah, you look at all of the... each of each of our cells has only has the same amount of genes but you have different bacterial species with variability. But but even at a cellular level, if you look at the cells, we we have about as many bacterial cells as we do uh, human cells in our bodies. So that that's you know pretty pretty impressive. Um, so that you know, and the thing that I like to remind people is because uh, especially in neuroscience and people. Um, you know, I, I, I guess it all comes back, we can talk about it later, but it all comes back to how we compartmentalize the body into disciplines. And that's what medicine does. And you, know, you have special, specialities in neurology and psychiatry uh, and specialities in in um, in gastroenterology or rheumatology or wherever. So it's, it's all partitioned. But, um, you know, but with the microbiome, it's important that, that we also step back and, and look at it from an evolutionary perspective mm -hmm. and realize that the microbes were there first. So there's never been a time where the brain has existed without mm -hmm. microbial signals. Mm -hmm. And so when you start thinking about that, and, and sometimes, you know, we have... Um, uh, 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 you know, given some of the roles that, that are really important for homeostasis over still to these bacteria that they still retain uh, some of them. And, and that can be quite surprising for people uh, to understand. But when you start thinking evolutionary like that within a framework, it, it, it does change. And I like to remind people in, in especially in the neurogeneration field, uh, that you know mitochondria, which are really important, you know, energy uh, uh, players in ourselves, are just microbes that got lost. You know, yeah. and, uh, and you know, when you look at some of the ontogeny of some of the immune 
aspects of uh, uh, immunometabolism and various things like that. Uh, they are coming from from mitochondria today, but they were they were they were, they were, they were, um, remnants of when these were bacteria. Uh, you know, billions of years ago. I you know I've been interested in plant chemicals, phytochemicals, and it yeah. turns out that. There's also bacteria and fungi that live coexist and viruses coexist with the plants in some sort of mutually beneficial way. And it turns out a good number of the drugs that were isolated from plants were actually produced by the bacteria, yeah. bacterial cells and not the plant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean it's yeah. it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Yeah. So so but it's not it's not He's, you know, it, it's one of these things where uh, p people can get very, um, uh, we're not trained to think like that. Right. Do you know, we're not trained in that holistic, yeah. integrative approach. Uh, and therefore, there's a, you know, I have to say, I've spent a lot of the last two decades being somewhat um, evangelical about this field, you know, where, 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 because there's a lot of skepticism and a lot of healthy skepticism because I think some of the claims can be yeah. easily uh, overhyped or exaggerated and it's important that we ground everything in 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 data but also that we ground everything within a, a biological framework that makes yeah. sense from an ecosystem ecology point of view of how we as humans navigate the environment that we live in as well you know and I think that's important so environment then so do different individual humans have, I assume yeah. they have different compositions of the gut? Yeah, no, it's a, great, it's a great question. I mean, there, there are a number of things to, to, to keep in, in mind. One is about how the, uh, the microbiome composition, and we're mainly talking about bacteria here, how the bacteria composition it changes in, in, in one individual across its lifespan. So for the most part, we're taught to be sterile and neutral, and we get these microbes as a kind of a birthday present from our moms on the day we're born. Uh, and and uh, these early frontier bacteria form the developing immune system. They start to help programming other systems uh, in, in the body overall. And um, and then by adolescent, by about the age of two to four, uh, it stabilizes, but it still is evolving and changing. By adolescence, there's less studies in adolescence. And, and it's one of the things because the adolescent brain is fascinating to me because it's a really important time uh, window for um, uh, you know um, pruning of 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 neuronal uh, activity. Um, but um, and then into adulthood, it's pretty stable within an individual. And then as we age, it starts to decline again uh, very much. Now between two individuals, if they live together, their microbiome tends to be quite. The same. If they're not living together, there 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 can be quite you know a variation uh, on that. And then across cultures and across uh, different factors, there will be different microbiomes. And what's driving these differences tends to be environmental factors. So in and especially this is most noticeable in early life. Where you study whether people, uh, kids are live in a, in a, a, a city or a green environment or on a farm, the, these studies have been done. Whether they're exposed to pets, whether they are, uh, what do they eat? If they have been breastfed or or bottle fed, if they have um, um, ex ex uh, lots of antibiotics or not, these are all the factors. Medications, about a quarter of all medications that are in pharmacies today will impact the microbiome in some way. Um, and that also goes the other way. Uh, the microbiome influences how medications induce their effects and, and in some cases, side effects. So a lot of factors, uh, you know, I, I often refer to the microbiome like a, it's, it's, it's like your own body's tree trunk of everything that's happened to you uh, in, 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 your, in your life. And, and, and although I somewhat poo-pooed uh, host genetics earlier, uh, by the one percent uh, of genes, but host genetics does play a very significant role as well. And so, understanding host genetics 
microbiome interactions is very important because our genes will will determine how our microbes are colonizing uh, the mucus layers, the various morphology and and uh, um, physical aspects of our bodies that will determine help to determine our our, our microbiomes as well. Um, so it it is dynamic. It is whatever else. I, I mean, neuroscientists always say to me, uh, you know, how can you study? It's just some well, it, you know, it's so complicated. How could you study all of this? And then I remind them that they're neuroscientists studying <laughs> the complexity of a brain that's changing in a millisecond levels all the time and we have no problem uh, you know studying it so your brain is equally as sensitive to all of these environmental influences that are going on all, all the time and and uh, so the 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 point about our microbiome is it's equally sensitive but in a more macro level uh, uh, to to what's going on so you you mentioned one of your early studies that you found that if you subject animals to stress bad stress yeah, and and I kind of distinguish bad bad chronic psychosocial stress from good stress, like exercise, like yeah. using your brain. So, um, what other you mentioned a bunch of environment. One of the first papers I think I saw on uh, microbiome in relation to human disease or health was obesity. That People with obesity have a, well, different composition. And I, my understanding is it's like fewer species or there's certain species of bacteria that yeah. they don't have. And yeah, the initial the initial work, which uh, isn't as isn't as straightforward as it, like most things in science. Uh <laughs> they haven't what what Jeff Gordon's group showed way back. Oh, maybe, probably close on 20 years ago now or, or thereabouts, they showed that there was a uh, alteration in the composition of uh, bacteria that were involved in energy harvesting. Um, and they did some interesting twin studies where one twin, uh, so they were able to really look at, at, at environmental versus genetic influence on this. And they did, uh, uh, they transplanted the microbiome from people into, into animals. And um, the obese uh, um, uh, bacteria were enough, were sufficient for the animals to, to gain weight more than whatever else. People have criticized some of these studies over the years, uh, but they, they really were, critical for getting the field to look at causal mechanisms of the microbiome and physiological processes. And so therefore they, 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 they're very important. Um, we now would argue that in the obesity field, uh, it's probably more complicated than just loss of certain uh, bacteria or whatever, but, but like everything else, it, it, it is complicated, but there's been amazing work you know, um, over the years, and and now it's moved towards interventions where you can target the microbiome with specific interventions and and alleviate uh, some aspects of obesity as well as metabolic syndrome. So there's a there is a push there that maybe the new Ozempic is going to be out of the gut. Well, GLP one is anyway. So so uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, <laughs> it, it, it it could be microbially derived, shall I say? Yeah, yeah. So you, I mean, I guess that early study was kind of a logical idea that, okay, these bacteria in your gut, what does the gut do? It metabolizes, yeah. breaks down the, the carbohydrates, the proteins, the lipids into smaller bits, and then they get into your system. And there was evidence bacteria are involved in that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that kind of makes sense. Um, but on the other hand, as far as calorie intake there's a pretty tight association between calorie intake over time and and body weight you know all other factors being equal um yeah okay. so yeah. so you know that anytime some new exciting area pops up the that's relevant to, for example, dietary supplements and so on. There's a lot of these companies that pick up on this and yeah, let's say this. So we've all heard of probiotics, right? And that's just 
eating good bacteria, right? Right. Yeah. So, um, and and I guess two things. One is just there is a lot of um, innovation in this field, which is really good. There's also a lot of snake oil yeah. in this in this field. And uh, my first thing is to uh, for is for buyers to be beware on everything. So when you're buying anything, ask where the evidence is. How good is the evidence? And, um, you know, um, within the constraints of first do no harm, most of this is harmless. Uh, uh, yeah. But the question is, is it is it good? Here in Europe, a probiotic has a very defined um, um, definition. It, it, it's very clear that a probiotic is a bacteria taken in adequate amounts that's live that confers a health benefit okay yeah that's a very clear definition but to prove that something confers a health benefit you have to do clinical studies trials yeah. that need to be placebo controlled and need to show efficacy in the u.s and canada what's on the market as probiotics has never most of us some have, but most of them have never met that uh, uh, high bar in terms of they've never shown efficacy uh, to have any health benefit. They, many of them have never shown that they can even survive the stomach acid. Uh, so, you know, so, 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 so that's the first thing. Um, so that, that, that's a difference. You can't use the word probiotic in, in europe so if you go if you go to to, to the uk or anywhere you, you won't see the word probiotic now you will see things not a million miles away from the word probiotic that you'll be you know uh but it's it's just it's just a, a different in regulation and regulation is important because you, you know fda will regulate things differently than here in europe but but it sets a tone it does set a tone the second thing is is the importance of precision when we talk about a probiotic, uh, you know, because each bacteria um, is it's in abil its ability to interact with the body can be at multiple levels. It can be due to what it's producing, can be due to what it's metabolizing, can be due to what's decorating its cell wall. It can be due to, you know, and then how it's interacting with the immune system. Um, it, you know, so, so, uh, and they can be quite, quite differences uh, among bacteria that sound very similar, uh, but, but when you go down to it, so, so we've done studies over the years on Bifido, like, and, and I'm a neuroscientist, so I, like, from, this was all new to me. So it took me, you know, some years to get my head around all of this. So bifidobacteria, we talk about bifidobacteria as good bacteria all the time, or lactobacillus. These are, you know, so I thought bifidobacteria, and then I realized, oh no, it's not that simple. So, so a bif longum is different to a to to a bif breve is different to, you know, another bif. So I got that, but then I realized, oh no, the a bif longum that that. Uh, produces this metabolite is going to be very different to a bif longum that produces. So, so we've done studies with 12 or 15 longums and they all do different things. So, so just going by the genus at the genus level, is it, you got to go down. Well, to it's, the, it's also at the functional level. So, so one of the things we're interested in is do these bacteria produce metabolites that can interfere with uh, act on various G protein coupled receptors, for example, uh, you know, and, and they do that, you know, so, so every one of these, these are quite different. So when someone says, well, I like probiotics, I think probiotics are going to be good for my, for my gut. It's like saying, I like drugs and I think drugs are going to be good for my headache. Uh, and you go into a pharmacy and you just pick random drugs and you take a lot of them and you hope that they might be good for your headache. Uh, and that's what, that's the level of precision that we're doing at, at the microbiome level, you know, and, and, and it, it may, it may, you know, so people are going choosing random uh, strains of bacteria uh, that, may or may not have any positive effects, putting them together in, 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 in a supplement and selling them to uh, a worried well people who, uh, you know, are willing to pay over the odds for them. And um, 
So, so that's when I'm a bit cynical about about it. So, but 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 to change that culture, what we have to do is invest in uh, studies that will look at, you know, two different strains of biff longums and look at whether they're going to do different things in different people and whether they need to be alive or not, or you know, and yeah. focus on the mechanism of how they're doing it. And that level of precision intervention is to me really important uh, because it, it, it'll help build confidence. Uh, and then there's of course the huge publication bias. So people only publish positive studies, uh, you know, and so we don't really know the the true true points of it. But going back to your initial question uh, about probiotics, yes, they are uh, really intriguing. For me, it's always intriguing that one strain of bacteria can exert powerful effects in the body when taken in the right amount in the right person with the right chosen bacteria, and so. That's kind of uh, a, a really good strategy if we can understand and and do the science to, to back it up. Okay, then what's a prebiotic? So a prebiotic then is basically the 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 the, the, the it's largely from the diet. Uh, it's basically the fertilizer to drive the blooming of the beneficial bacteria. So, you know, it's it really, uh, it, 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 and uh, they tend to be fibers and sugar carbohydrates uh, that come from, from, from the diet. And uh, it's basically the raw material. Um, if you think of your microbiome, and this is, I like to explain this to people. If you think of your microbiome in your gut as a, as a factory, uh, and it, it, it's, a, it's an industrial factory that's producing all kinds of chemicals, many of which that our bodies wouldn't be able to make without us like uh, key among these and, and and are they short chain fatty acids like butyrate propionate acetate these are really important for giving energy to the colonocytes in our gut and many other cells as well and we're really working on what they do but we can't make short chain fatty acids humans have mammals have no capacity to make them except from um, the microbial fermentation of fiber from the diet so microbes take the diet so, so then you start to see, like all factories depend on two things, at least. Uh, one is the quality of the raw materials coming in. So that's the quality of the diet coming in. And the second then is the, um, how the workers are doing their job. And so that's how the bacteria are doing their job. And so the pharmacologist in me was like, can we just bypass all of that and go to the end products? And could we just not work on the, on, on and, and people are looking at that. And, and there's studies ongoing right now in the stress field, looking at at, at, at a colonic delivery of short chain fatty acids, for example, yeah. and, and and using that as, a, as, as an approach. But it, but, 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 but it is quite a, a, an important thing. So prebiotics are basically that raw material um, and uh, they're um, very much uh, present in, 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 in with fiber uh, and, and how fermented foods are driving it as well. Okay, so if you if you eat fermented food, they, they have a lot of butyrate and propionate in them? Yeah, so so the fermented foods, what they do is that they have a lot of the bacteria already that allow it to to produce. Um, uh, the the uh, but you still need the dietary. You still need to get the the fiber in there as well. You know, so so we're actually doing some human studies at the moment. So about one quarter of my lab or one third of my lab has pivoted towards humans over the years, and that's been the evolution where we're looking at fermented foods and fiber alone and together to see if we could have some beneficial effects on brain health. And uh, it, it's really exciting because it's taking uh, studies we've done in animals all the way to, 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 to humans. And what I like is that uh, fiber and fermented foods as strategies don't have to be sold in um, health food stores. They, you can democratize this pretty quickly. Fiber is cheap. Uh, fermented foods are cheap so you can get to socioeconomic groups that might benefit most from from this but culturally like we're terrible in ireland we don't have a culture of, of fermented foods and our fiber levels are very low in the in the habitual diet the u.s is probably similar yeah. there will be pockets of you know probably in the midwest with german ancestry or somewhere is you know uh, where people do have a better uh, 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 take up but it, it is quite interesting to me that we have potential solutions 
And work coming out of Stanford from Justin Sonnenberg's uh, group has really shown the impact on the immune system of fiber and fermented foods is really, really strong. And so uh, my question is then, can we look at this from a brain perspective and behavior? Okay, well, let, that's one last thing. We've got to get to the brain quickly now. But um, so there are a lot of bacteria in the soil. In fact, my understanding is like most of the biomass in the soil is bacteria and a lot of and vegetables grow on bacteria. I'm thinking of carrots or yeah. potatoes. And so I've heard that, you know, you don't want to scrub them. And those, some of the bacteria on those vegetables may be actually good for your microbiota. Is it? Yeah. Like, like, I mean, if we live in too clean of a world, then it's not good for us. It's generally, it's generally how it is. Uh, there is no good data yet on 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 organic, you know, like, you know, on uh, exposure to them bacteria and human health that I'm aware of, okay. you know, overall. But there is for, for for the health of the actual vegetable. So you 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 have a much better vegetable. So so therefore the knock on effects could be could be there uh, overall, you know. Okay, so you've told us that different environmental factors can affect the composition of the gut microbiome, and the gut microbiome is important for energy metabolism. They also produce bacteria, produce certain chemicals that we don't get otherwise. Um, yeah. So talk about how do you determine whether certain gut bacteria affect the brain. So start with animal studies. What are the different ways you manipulate the gut microbiome? No, it's, it's a great question. I mean, for us, one of the one of the biggest tools we've had after was the ability to look at, um, it, you know, is the, it, mice that grow up without any exposure to bacteria. So these are germ free mice. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is a extreme model. Yeah. So there's probably no human uh, counterparts, maybe the boy in the bubble that Paul Simon sang about in the 1980s. These these mice in a bubble, though, do allow us to answer the question, is the microbiome involved? Yes or no. Yeah. And work that initially came out of uh, um, uh, Sweden and Canada, and we had the data at the same time, but they, they, they published first, um, uh, all showed that the brain of these animals is quite different at multiple levels, uh, especially in terms of, of uh, various neurotransmitters in the initial uh, findings and, uh, and that they have a different uh, behavioral response. We went on then to show um, across uh, multiple levels in the brain, remarkable and you know, using non-biased transcriptomics, for example, we were able to show that in the prefrontal cortex, the, um, there was an upregulation of genes involved in myelination. Now, that was really surprising to me. Um, and it was very specific to the prefrontal cortex and really specific to, to males. It was much more robust in males than females. And uh, that's something that that, 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 that that that's really intriguing because it means that you could now target the microbiome in your gut and affect myelination processes in the brain and opens up opportunities. We've recently and unpublished, but we've reproduced this in the zebrafish uh, and we could we like the zebrafish model as, a, as, a, as another model as well and it's 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 it, it, it's really intriguing uh, overall. We've also moving from we've also shown that um, adult uh, hippocampal neurogenesis, the birth of new neurons, it's really important for complex cognitive processes like pattern separation, uh, stress sensitivity, and antidepressant action. That that is uh, out of the, the regulation of, of, of the birth of these new neurons out of kilter in these germ-free animals. We've looked at arborization, and particularly within the amygdala, we find that there's an increased arborization of uh, basolateral amygdala neurons uh, uh, overall. Uh, we're looking at the blood-brain barrier. We're really excited about the blood brain barrier and and uh, showing uh, defects there we have microglia activation in the brain uh, work from Marco Prince's group originally and Sonia Garel uh, they showed and, and and something we're following up on that the ability of microglia to respond to a stimulus is completely not working uh, overall so almost anywhere you look in the brain you find that the the absence of microbes disturbs 
uh, key fundamental processes in some kind of specific way that tends to be sex dependent. So that's, yeah, very interesting. So you mentioned a number of brain regions, hippocampus, very important for yeah. learning and memory, uh, amygdala, important in fear and anxiety responses, prefrontal and, and social behavior. And so, and, and prefrontal cortex involved in decision making and, yeah. and these higher complex. So you have behavioral. So you have you shown in all three of those instances that yeah. there's some behavioral core. Exactly. So so that was the next thing, and we published on showing as you would expect. So the stress sensitivity was the first thing we were showing that they have. Uh, but then we, we we showed that they have deficits in fear learning. Um, more on the recall, so the amygdala dependent recall, uh, we showed in terms of uh, the um, central response to abdominal pain. So that's very much amygdala driven. Uh, they've in increased visceral hypersensitivity behaviorally. And perhaps the most robust finding that we have is that there are, uh, and that's why I highlighted it, uh, is that there are social deficits in germ-free animals. So if you give them the opportunity to spend time with a with a uh, mouse versus an object or an empty chamber, they'll gravitate. Uh, most animals will gravitate towards the mouse, but germ-free mice don't aren't able to differentiate. And m normally a mouse like mice like humans can be a bit fickle. So if you give them the chance to have a new playmate versus their everyday playmate, they'll gravitate towards a new playmate, but not if they're germ-free. So yeah. we we found like and 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 that led me really some years ago um, to to start having these conversations like why from an evolutionary perspective again why is it that if you're in a social environment uh, and you can take that that uh, you require adequate microbes in your gut at least if you're a mouse uh, to have normal social responses. And so together with a, a zoology colleague and an evolutionary colleague, we, 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 we did a kind of a survey, it's about four or five years ago now, and we published it in science. So, so it was quite an uh, important perspective across the animal kingdom, whether it's a bumblebee in a hive or a baboon in the wild in Africa. We just harnessed all the data that was available at that point and looked at if you change social hierarchies or social dynamics, the microbiome seems to be changing uh, as expected. But the other way around, if you start to change the microbiome, the one behavior that seems to come through time and time again is behaviors related to sociability. So there's something about the social brain and then the, the network of that, probably from a brainstem, a hypothalamus, amygdala, cortical interaction uh, that, 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 that is particularly sensitive to... Um, to uh, microbial signals. And then that leads me to diseases of the social brain. Okay, so the microbiome is playing a very important role in brain development. You indicated that, that these germ-free animals have abnormal sociality. You indicated, I think it was that, that the males see, seem to be more, more affected, but you haven't mentioned autism, right? And no, I, well, it, it comes, it comes into, it comes into diseases, and and so we, so that's where we ended up uh, thinking more about autism. Yeah. Uh, it was an area I didn't want to go into because, controversially, over decades we know that the association between um, uh, the gut, the immune system, and autism is very controversial because you doesn't take long before you stray into uh, areas which we now know are disproven in relation to you know other things. So I I, I didn't really want to go there, uh, to, but the data sometimes the data just takes you there, and uh, and, and so we 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 found in mouse first in mouse models of autism uh, that there are changes in the gut microbiome. In particular, we published on showing that there was a reduction in specific. Blautia bacteria that that, that 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 were there, and again in mouse models we showed that if we put this Blautia back, we could attenuate the social and the repetitive behavioral deficits in this mouse model. 
other groups, many other groups are, are, are focused on autism. Um, we were also more interested in, in, in other disorders of social, because people always think of social brain, autism, and it's really important and really, you know, but, it, but, but, and then understanding the interactions with, with genetics is really important there because, uh, you know, the, there's a clear genetic basis to autism, but there is an environmental aspect as well. And so the question is, is the microbiome holding the key to some of that environmental aspects uh, oh, oh, overall. But th there's another disorder that that people don't talk about of the social brain, which is social anxiety disorder. And that's a disorder which is very common, one of the most common anxiety disorders. And we showed last year that the microbiome is very different in patients with social anxiety disorder. But we did one other thing in a paper that just came out a few months ago uh, in PNAS where we showed that if we took the microbes from patients with social anxiety disorder and gave them to normal, healthy mice, um, that uh, for the most part, all of their behavior was the same, their normal social behavior, everything was fine. But when we looked at a model of social fear extinction, which is very uh, close model of 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 uh, social anxiety. Uh, we have clear deficits. We could transplant uh, uh, basically from human phenotype into animals and really show that these were correlating with changes in oxytocin and vasopressin, key hormones involved in in sociability and social. So so it's autism for sure, but I think it's other disorders of the social brain are, are equally worthy of investigation in this regard. Yeah, so now, right, so the germ-free animals, you actually can't distinguish between uh, bacteria in the gut versus bacteria no. on the skin or the nose or the mouth. No. So I mean, the, the only way we can do it, and this is work that, that came out of uh, Sarkis Masmanian's group in 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 um, in in, in uh, Caltech. Sarkis, they had a paper where they show that when they bred, um, they they gave germ-free mice the microbes from from um, children with autism, and then they bred them for one um, one generation. So in the germ-free facility, so now you're just putting microbes back into the gut. And and uh, they were able to show uh, some levels of deficits and changes in brain activity and excitatory inhibitory balance and variety of factors. So so there are ways to get at it. And but 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 you're so right that that there are many orifices other than the gut uh, that that are playing a role here. And okay, so I think you mentioned fecal transplant. So what what's going on now clinically? In humans, uh, there's a lot of data out there. You know, uh, you know, people with one condition maybe they have a different composition of the gut microbiota. But what about actually treating people with bacteria? Yeah, no, I, I think that's where we're. We, you know, we need more data. We need longitudinal data. We need more precision. We need back-to-back -back studies. There, there is quite a number of. Um, in addition, we're, we're showing in larger meta-analysis now that there are deficits of um, specific, especially these short-chain fatty acid-producing bacteria across multiple psychiatric phenotypes. And so people are now doing studies uh, looking at um, bacteria that produce short-chain fatty acids, and, and there's ongoing studies uh, with that. And <clears throat> The quality of these are improving. The, the the size of these is getting better. So I'm quite optimistic on that. Um, there is diet studies um, that we know that specific diets that are targeting the microbiome. We we coined this. We we, we coined the word psychobiotic because we uh, as a word that for interventions that target the microbiome for mental health benefit. And and these psychobiotic diets are now being trialed and tested. And I, and I think that there's going to be a lot of uh, 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 really good uh, data to emerge in, in that. And also understanding which patients will respond to which intervention at which time, you know, it's going to be really important. The fecal transplants in, in the, the brain area, uh, there are ongoing studies. Uh, Valerie Taylor, for example, has studies in bipolar in Canada, uh, and the initial data from that are somewhat promising. There have been studies in 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 um, 
autism um, in autistic uh, individuals. Uh, again, open labeled, need much more data. You know, we always have to be, we, you know, we have to be self-critical about where we are, but we have to start somewhere. So, so that's kind of, you know, I can, you know, it's very easy. It's a field you can easily criticize. And, and there's a lot of armchair critics out there who just want to criticize the field. But for me, we need to get data and we need to just, you know, understand, you know, what are the constraints and modifying the microbiome? Because like, the, the, like for me, the main thing is, is that with your genome, there's not a lot you can do except blame your parents and your grandparents. But with your microbiome, there is an opportunity for modification. And that gives people and patients agency potentially over their own healthcare and their own brain. Uh, so uh, I think that's going to be really important uh, moving forward. Yeah, I agree 100%. And there's, I had a, at NIH, when I was at NIH, um, they have a post back fellow program. Yeah, I know it. Yeah. Yeah, and I had one student came to the lab, then he went up to Harvard to graduate school, and he he became a fecal donor. They they have this, they like screen people yeah. to find people whose poop super has, super pooper. Super poopers. Uh and but eventually, don't you think it'll be uh just taking like a capsule with bacteria in it? I, I I think that will that that will be really good if we can get there, but I also think that if if, if it allows people to look at their diets better and yeah. understand you, you know how that could could actually do it, and um, you know I mean the other part of it is is and what what I'm really fascinated right now which which you'll be interested in of course is is the circadian aspects of all of this because uh, there's there's a clear relationship between regulation of of, of our circadian clock and our mood uh, overall and the microbiome is regulating all of this ah that so let's get to how how are these bacteria in the gut yeah. Affecting the brain. There's more than one way that could happen. Yeah, no, and the, and they will vary across the lifespan and, and probably across the day. So uh, the first way is the way I was talking about is the producing of these metabolites. Yeah. These are the chemicals. They they go into the systemic circulation and they activate uh, uh, across the blood brain barrier directly. And so that's one way. Second is through the immune system. We now know very well the immune system is it regulates the brain and the brain regulates the immune system. That's a really clear, clear way. We've been fascinated for many years on the vagus nerve. This is uh, we showed in our 2011 paper when you cut the vagus nerve, all of the effects of the bacteria were gone. So as I like to remind people, what happens in Vegas doesn't just stay in Vegas and will affect our emotions in different ways. Um, but it's still a black box. Like the, 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 we, we don't know how the signals get from the lumen of the gut to the vagus. And even when the vagus gets into the, say, into the nucleus tractus solitarius and the brainstem, uh, like how does that synapse on emotional circuits to modify behavior? These are the projects we have ongoing right now to try and really use circuit neuroscience to dissect out what's going on uh, uh, there. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. And then finally is on various hormones. We know uh, that through whether it's oxytocin or, or, or other gut hormones, but there's direct relationships between the microbiome there. So all of these pathways and, and you know, dissecting the relative contribution of them at different time points needs to be done more. And if they, you know, it's, it's something that I, I'm trying to secure more and more funding for to try and, and do that uh, overall. Yeah, so I've had in previous podcasts, I had, uh, you know, so we did a lot of work related to Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and and as you well know, the story in Parkinson's where the pathology seems to begin in the gut and then yeah. kind of retrogradely go up, apparently yeah. the vagus nerve. And uh, but also, I had Kevin Tracy. Have you come up? Yeah, I know Kevin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I did a podcast with him, and because when I learned about the vagus. And I think probably you too, just in basic, I, I don't know where, undergraduate or something. Yeah. That, cranial nerve, cranial that everything nerve. was going this way. It was, you know, it was controlling the heart rate and the gut motility. You know, the, it uses acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter. So I, you know, at one point I had this, early on I had this vision. It's just sending signals. But then it turns out most of the 
of the act processes, axons, if you will, in the vagus are actually going from the peripheral organs up to the brain, you know, show, suggesting the heart's communicating with the brain uh, gut that way. So, but you did studies, right, where you cut the vagus nerve? You cut the vagus. This is our classic study uh, in 2011 and uh, showed that the effects of a specific lactobacillus were all gone. Yeah. So, <laughs> So how so, do you think that's working? You think it's just uh, they're just somehow affecting? The, so I, uh, I I I think uh, but we need more data that they and there's some work from Wolfgang Kunze in 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 uh, in, in Canada um, on this is 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 that they're able to interact with various channels in the enteric nervous system which um, are able to uh, synapse onto the to the vagus. So it's so it's you know we have more nerves in our gut than we do our spinal cord. And so the enteric nervous system is a really good conduit for vagal interactions. And so, but we still don't fully appreciate all of the levels of interactions at the enteric nervous system uh, point of view. And that's something that, that deserves a lot more attention. Because the bacteria don't come in direct contact with the... no, no, no. But but uh, well, you'd hope it, it's unlikely. Uh, but their metabolites will, or or they may give off some of their their cell wall um, uh, peptidoglycans and various other things from, from from the cell wall, which which can interact uh, with various aspects of of. of okay, uh... so so if you take like the short chain fatty acids or like branch chain amino acids and yeah. and you and you give them to an animal and see an effect on the brain those studies have been done right yeah, not, not as much as you think there have, okay. there's been some study uh, there's been one study in humans done it, looking at acetase using brain imaging um we need way more brain imaging like I, like like you know in this field like there's very little human brain imaging done yet and like these are, you know, these are easy experiments. Um, and if the grant gods were ever good to us, we would have got them funded. But or you I can think just, it's just take bacteria right in the in a, in yeah. a whatever flask in the and and collect the medium the bacteria are yeah. producing these, and then and and then put it onto the vagus nerve, or, or people are doing them right, or even. Even do electrophysiology, record from neurons, and see if these. Yeah. So uh, the electrophysiologists have been very, very slow. Like I used to say, in my lab did everything except electrophysiology, uh, and, then, and then. Well, we that, but but there's another thing you can do quickly: calcium imaging. I did a lot yeah. of that over the years. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, so we're doing some photometry now as well. So okay. in the brain, so to like, like you know, and we're doing slice electrophysiology, uh, and we've shown that, for example, germ-free mice don't uh, have an LTP response. Male germ-free mice. Uh, females, no problem. Males, no LTP. Do you, have any, you have any idea on that sex difference? What no, it's intriguing, but it, it it's in line with many of the, many, like if you think, go back to autism, it's four to one more prevalent in, yeah. in males. Um, if you, I talk to my neurology colleagues, a lot of the early life, brain injury susceptibility are more prevalent in in males there's something there it deserves a lot more attention i'm going to the organization for the study of sex differences to give a plenary this weekend and uh i'll probably get some good ideas from that okay and there's some evidence that the bacteria also can produce precursors to neurotransmitters, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 And and they they they, they often use them for different reasons. So so they, they, they like like they they can uh, um, we're quite interested in tryptophan metabolism and 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 they can uh, serotonin GABA. They use GABA as a pH moderator in bacteria. So all of these. But the question is, most of that stays locally in the gut, and it has the potential then to interfere with the enteric nervous system but probably isn't affecting what's going on in the brain directly, but, but could be through indirect uh, 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 mechanisms. Yeah. Good. And then can you talk about that? Your, to finish up here, your APC group. And yeah, because it, I'm just kind of interested in kind of the, the whole bigger picture of what's going on there at Cork. 
Yeah. So, so as I said, uh, we got, you know, the, the government decided strategically to invest in core areas of expertise. And so they, they, they funded the, the center 20 years ago. We celebrated 20 years. Uh, and, but, but in Ireland, like, nothing is easy. We don't have an NIH. So we, uh, they say for every euro we give you, you have to bring two euro from somewhere else. So, but they're, but they're still in the EU. Yeah, yeah. We're, so, so that, so, so we, so we get EU funding, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, and we work with industry, and we, um, my lab is also now uh, funded through uh, philanthropy. Uh, so, so through these different mechanisms, we're able to do it, and so it's been an amazing. There's over three hundred people in the in the in our center in my group the, of the brain gut axis. You know, I, I the, the, there's over uh, fifty people working on brain gut. Uh, communications. It's fabulous number of, uh, including key uh, faculties, people with European Research Council grants, people who are leading the way on circuit neuroscience. It's, so, uh, and uh, it's 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 really a dynamic uh, group, and we have people from all over the world, including the US, coming to Cork to play and to try and uncover the secrets of how the microbiome is talking to the brain. So you have a bricks and mortar uh, actual, or is it uh, just a yeah. collect? Yeah, well, it's a bricks and mortar building just there. Uh, uh, but I also I am also the VP for research. So I, my office now is in, it, 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 it is in the administration side. of the yeah, that's, that's very exciting. You had the opportunity to recruit junior faculty and oh, it's, super, it's been super. And the, and and, you know, and and, and the, you know, people want to come and stay. And we have we, we have faculty from from Spain, uh, from Romania, from um, um, India uh, and some Irish, uh, you know, who 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 are really uh, intrigued about applying their aspects of what their neurobiology questions are and how the microbiome is regulating that because the microbes were there first, Mark. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, you know, we've done a lot of work on mitochondria, so I'm, you know, I know. I've, I've been <laughs> studying the mitochondria within neurons quite a bit, and that's pretty interesting. Uh, it's, it's fascinating, and I, I think there's a real connection here to the microbiome and mitochondrial function, and, I've, you know, it's one of the things that I feel, you know, really that, that we could be... There's an unmasking to do, you know, uh, yes. So these different different species of bacteria communicate with each other. And in, a, in quorum sensing is really important. And so, so I'm wondering if there's some, <laughs> I'm getting a little out there, but so you've got these mitochondria and neurons in the, and other cells in the brain, right? And they're originated from bacteria. And then you've got, bacteria in the microbiome. I wonder if there's any direct, you know, it could be through chemical direct communication. Well, like, like, you know, if you look at it, like, like I was reading some of the work more recently on immuno uh, metabolism, where they're talking about toll-like receptors and, and oh. the mitochondria and, how, how, you know, and they're responding to, to bacteria and, you know, you, you can see how things have evolved. Uh, over, you know, we did. I don't know if you're aware of this, John. We did some studies on toll-like receptors a while ago with okay, no, TLR four, TLR four, TLR two knockout mite. Yeah, yeah, and 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 found behavioral, yeah, uh, alterations in in mice, and and I've often wondered about. So, how ancient are those signaling systems? Because if you look at evolution, uh, well. It was thought that the innate immune cells were probably there before nerve cells during evolution, but humoral, the cells that immune cells that circulate in our blood, they only came into being at, after organisms already had nervous systems. Then all these immunologists, they get blood cells for, and they can easily look and they discover these different immunological signaling pathways and and then we and others find they're in neurons, but maybe actually some of these were in neurons before they were in 
Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's fascinating. I mean, well, it, the thing is, it's everything is connected. When it goes to the microbiome, it expands what you think about. And the, the goal we have is trying to bring it together with data and trying to, but it, it, it really, it's been really a, a, a journey for me uh, to, you know, think outside and it, 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 it's relevant to many other disciplines it, even relevant to aspects of philosophy about what it means to be self uh, 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 o, 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 overall and so um I uh, I think we have a, we still have a long way to go mark uh, so that you know myself for sure and I'm sure the administration at Cork is happy you left uh, Novartis the industry yeah. and, <laughs> and I think you, you are too right you have it's really well, nice that, to be able to do what you want to do and not be constrained yeah, by a particular Exactly, industry. exactly. No, no. My time in industry was was superb. Um, really was, you know, I was like a kid in a toy store with access to tools. You know, my lab was one of the first to put sRNA into the mouse brain uh, in vivo. Oh. You know, we could, we could get access to things that you just, you, you know, a chemist could make a compound quickly um you know it was it was wonderful but uh, would i have sustained in the you know and, and it, 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 it perhaps if there was industry in ireland for research i would have maybe stayed in an industry setting but i wanted it was more returning to ireland that was driving me but i'm very happy with that decision uh, and uh, i've got to have you know colleagues here like like ted dynan and jerry clark and people who are really amazing people to to work with over the years and it's really about the people and the trainees that have come in uh, that that keeps me very much going yeah well john thanks for taking the time for this my pleasure um, i'm gonna in the description section i'm gonna put links to a number of your articles and you can and and, and, and people can check out the new netflix documentary hack your health uh the secrets of the gut. that's uh that features some of our work oh okay great i'll i'll do that later today i'm i'm semi-retired so i it's number number one and it's been number one. It just was released last week. It was number one in nineteen countries and no in top five in the US. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thanks again. <laughs> All right, Mark. Good good talking to you. Cheers. Likewise. Bye.